25th of June last year, I joined the Airgrid Group. It was one of the proudest days in my career. Um, literally three weeks later, I found myself in the Ballymascanlan Hotel, just north of Dundalk, with the board of Airgrid and the executive team, starting a journey to create a new strategy for Airgrid. And two, two clear memories coming out of that was one, a real sense of ambition coming from the board of Airgrid. And secondly, a decision we made, we're going to do this ourselves. We're not going to outsource it to big ticket consultants. We're going to leverage the extensive capabilities within our organization to come up with the answers to the great challenges facing Airgrid Group and Ireland, Inc. and Northern Ireland over the, over the next 10 years. And I think that was one of the best decisions we have ever made. This is my mom. She's, Kay is her name. She's 88 years of age. Um, She's clearly very dependent on electricity. She's heard stuff about climate change to the extent that every warm day, she now says, must be due to climate change. Uh, Travelling to Galway this year, we passed the Cluj Valley Wind Farm, something I was had the great pleasure of being involved in, and she's declared she likes windmills. Um, she likes my electric golf because it doesn't make any noise. She doesn't have an electricity bill. She has an ESB bill because she trusts the ESB. And trust for her generation is one of the most important themes, concepts, that, that they hold really, really dear to their heart. The other end of the spectrum, this is Leo. This is my nephew, so that's mum's grandson. Um, he's the one on the right, just to be clear. <laughs> Leo is 11, precocious, incredibly technologically literate, um, fantastic artist. I think he'll be on the artistic side rather than the engineering side. And I asked him, what did he know about climate change? What did he think about climate change? So he gave me this, this graphic. And, it's, and I said, what is this? And he said, it's a penguin who's crying because their habitat's being destroyed. And interesting, his perspective, because the sun is in it. Um, and there's maybe some, some small little bit of confusion there. But his his major theme is one of expectation. This generation have enormous expectations of their parents, of our generation. And as we start to think about framing a strategy in the context of the enormous challenge that's in front of us, we're going to see these two themes of trust and expectation and to some extent clashing with one another. And we as leaders, and as solution providers in business are going to have to reconcile that and come up with the solutions. Last year, at this conference, when we were in Cork, I, had, I made a strong play on the Waiting for Godot theme, which is the, the famous um, uh, Samuel Beckett play, because there was no public discourse in relation to climate change. I was bemoaning the, the lack of such and the fact that despite all that was going on in our world, nobody seemed interested in even having a conversation. And clearly, we've traveled a long way in 12 months. But before we start looking forward, and before we start seeing how are we going to deal with these challenges, I want to look back. And it's not that I'm big into looking into ancient history, but Ireland as a country is only 100 years old in, in terms of being a sovereign state and having control over its own destiny. And we can look at moments in the last 100 years that are seminal moments in terms of how people, politicians, business people, etc., provided extraordinary vision and extraordinary leadership at times of great challenge for the nation. I'm thinking of Ardna Krusha in the 1920s, where the state spent 20% of all of its revenues on, on power generation to, to provide people with electricity. Rural elect electrification which took 20 years to deliver. Uh, free education under Dunica O'Malley, which many would argue is the foundation stone of the prosperity we enjoy today in this, in this century. The IDA, the construct that is the IDA, and the looking out beyond our shore to solutions in, in the broader world and starting the process of encouraging companies to come and invest in Ireland. The Good Friday Belfast Agreement in, 19, in 1998, where we, peace was brought to our island. A myriad of quality infrastructure 
which got built during the Celtic Tiger. There is a strong legacy. We're, we're standing in one of these, sitting in one of these wonderful pieces of iconic infrastructure today. In 2007, the White Paper on Energy, which was created by a Fianna Fáil Green government, and within a number of months, the carbon, uh, the carbon budget, signed up to 40% renewables on the power system by 2020. Most people thought that was mad, that that could never be achieved, that that was the influence of the Green Party exercising their muscle in government and signing up to, for something that no, nobody thought possible. And of course, we're looking at the, um, the horror of, of, of unfinished houses. We've survived as a nation, the worst recession in, in, our, in our history for most of us. I, I think nobody has experienced anything worse, certainly for 56, 60 years. And why am I, why am I emphasizing this look back? Because it should give us a sense of confidence and a sense of self-belief when we take on another seminal challenge in terms of our history, that actually when we really dig deep, when there is strong vision, when there is strong leadership, it is extraordinary what we can achieve because history tells us we have achieved in the past. Today, literally on the 17th of June of this year, the whole cabinet arrived in Grange Gorman and announced the Climate Action Plan. And this was, for me, an extraordinary turnaround in terms of leadership and in terms of sentiment. The, joint, the, the Citizens' Assembly in October of last year, their report was reviewed by the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Climate Change. And that has found its way, in terms of all of its recommendations, into one of the most visionary pieces of public policy or public ambition that we have ever seen. And it recognises, in a very explicit way, that we're in the really serious transformation business. This is not about evolution. This is about revolution. And equally, and fair credit to Theresa May, the last thing she did before leaving office, much maligned uh, former UK Prime Minister, she passed the legislation for zero net carbon in the United Kingdom by 2050. Again, a visionary piece of, a visionary piece of work. Excuse me, just one moment. So, what is the Climate Action Plan? So I took on the rather daunting challenge when I committed to the board. I'll give it to you in one slide. That was uh, two, two months ago. And my goodness, the amount of time it took to crystallize it in one slide. But here goes. The 2017, Ireland, the last reference here, um, emitted 60 million tonnes of carbon dioxide or equivalent. Okay, that's the term, that term that's used. And the trajectory is going absolutely in the wrong direction. And you've heard um, John Fitzgerald talk about, about it, you've talked Laura Burke of the EPA, et cetera. The, so with, on a do-nothing basis, we are heading into complete car crash territory. And what the minister and his team have done in consultation with, 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 with um, people in the market, they've looked at where can we affect the seminal transformation that we need. And we've looked, and he has looked, to electricity. And what underpins his 70% resi target that he's asking us all to sign up to is a very, very substantial re reduction in carbon in the electricity sector from 12 to 4.5 million tonnes. And then that catalytic effect of affecting a revolution in transport, probably the biggest revolution in transport since Henry Ford developed the Model T over 100 years ago that by having green electricity and by moving from fossil fuels to electricity and transport, you can affect another change from 12 to 7.5. And thirdly, by tackling the issue of house heat loss in homes, by retrofitting homes, and then by moving heating from fossil to electricity, we can affect another 2.5 million tonnes. You'd see there's a little bit of tinkering around the edges in agriculture and a small, I suppose, a, a to tokenistic maybe, referenced industry because maybe the view is industry has done as much as it can. I don't know. But the critical message here is that 90% of the heavy lifting is around the whole electricity system 
and, and the electrification of uh, transport and heat. As I say, the numbers don't lie. And the objective in this climate action plan is crystal clear. It's about effecting a 27.5% reduction in CO2 emissions, not just on the basis of today, but on the, also picking up all the growth that's going to happen in the economy and mitigating that out. So that's the challenge. That's the challenge that has been given to us in Airgrid and to all, you know, there's leaders from all parts of the sector here. That is, that is the challenge. And it'll be very easy to determine are we winning or are we not? Because the numbers will tell the story and they'll tell it on an ongoing basis. So, I love this statement from Michael Porter because the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do. The beauty of what's in front of us, if I may use that word, is it's really, really clear what we have to do. No distractions, no alternative propositions. The path has been laid out for us and the signpost has been posted and we know where we need to go. So what, what is Airgrid's response to this? Because at one stage, when we started on our strategy journey and the board talked about ambition, one of our big concerns is us having an ambition that's disconnected with what's coming out of government, because there was nothing coming out of government at that point last year. So firstly, it's a huge relief, relief that the ambition that the Airgrid board and Airgrid has for this company is now absolutely in sync with what the government is asking of us to do. And we've gone right back to the beginning. Airgrid was formed 13 years ago um, and has had a, a, a particular focus in its first 13 years, the single electricity market, interconnection, many of the stuff that John, John Cher the chairman mentioned. But we asked ourselves, what is our purpose? What are we about now with this enormous challenge that has been put to us? How does this, what's our, what's our new DNA going to look like? What is going to be the essence of the Airgrid and Sony proposition as we take on this challenge? And again, and really, it gives me really great pleasure to say that this purpose statement has come from our staff. So the staff have journeyed with us on the strategy. They've done all the insights. They've looked with me and the executive team at all the options. And they have said, this is what our purpose should be. And it's to transform the power system for future generations. Only seven words. Very simple to say, rolls off the tongue. First thing is transform. Tran this is not about evolution. This is about very, very radical transform transformation on a scale that we have not seen before in Airgrid, that the electricity system has not seen before, and that as a nation we have not seen before. Secondly, it's the power system is now an increasingly complex uh, jigsaw almost of all sorts of elements, all of which have to work for, for the system to deliver and to stay stable. We've hundreds of generators now between renewable and conventional. We've, we've so many market participants since, since ISEM as new parties have come into play. We have a whole series of people providing services in, to keep the grid stable. A, a whole new ecosystem has grown up. We have the grid, which is the highway for electricity. We have the control system, which has to you know, keep the system stable with high levels of renewables. So we now are talking about a really complex, interconnected, intricate system, which then we overlaid the single electricity ISEM project last year, bringing the market and the power system all together into one holistic, highly complex proposition. So that's what we have to transform, not just one element, but all of the interlinking components. And clearly, the last point is, is very obvious. It mightn't have been 12, 15 months ago when the conversation wasn't there, but the voice of the youth has come forward and said, you need to be doing this for us and not leaving us with an appalling legacy. That's our purpose. We're proud of it. I'm proud it's come from our staff. And I think it really speaks to what we're about and what we're trying to achieve. And it should guide us in everything we do, in every plan we have, in every interaction, etc. Our strategy can, be, can, can literally be summarized in a triangle. 
Sitting on top is our purpose, which I've just talked to. Our primary goal, we've suggested one primary goal and three supporting goals, is to lead the island's electricity sector on sustainability and decarbonisation. That's not an arrogant statement. That's not saying we're the only leaders, because there are many other leaders who will have to play their role. And one of the strong team themes coming out today, and we're hearing it from Richard Burton and Richard Bruton, is the the responsibility on leaders, but we are one of the key leaders. We recognize that, and I'll explain to you what that actually means in terms of what we're going to do. Our supporting goals operate, develop, enhance the All-Ireland grid and market. There, there may be a long statement for never lose sight of our original remit, which to make sure the power system is stable and robust at all times, and what we take for granted in 99.999% of the times that that switch always works at, works at home, that we never lose sight of the basics in terms of our core remit. And there's an awful lot happening in that world even if we didn't have the decarbonisation challenge. Thirdly, work with partners for positive change. We can't do this on our own, and I'm going to speak to that in more detail, and engage for better outcomes for all. Not better outcomes for some, but some mechanism by which the engagement leads to a win-win for all parties. So let's go into the leading the Ireland's electricity sector on sustainability and decarbonisation. Henry Kissinger once said, leading is about bringing people from a place they are to a place they've never been. And there is no question in terms of the challenge facing us, we're going to a place we have never been. Because the expectation, if we're to deliver 70% renewables on the power system in 2030, on average, then on a windy, wet and windy and cold November evening in 2030, practically the whole of the island, north and south, will have to be powered by onshore wind and offshore wind with a small bit of services on the system. That's what we'll have to be able to achieve. You're not going to achieve 70% on average if you aren't exploiting those periods in the year where the wind is blowing um, and, this, and indeed the sun is shining, including solar technology. So that's a place we have never been. And it couldn't be clearer about where we need to get to. So that's, that is the, um, that's, that's the ambition. Secondly, we have to paint a picture of 2030 of the system so that we can engage with people in the market, people in the sector, but also people in the lay world who want to understand what does the world in 2030 look like? And secondly, what is the best route to get there? The best route in terms of our ability to deliver and crucially, our ability to demonstrate it's the most cost effective because decarbonization is absolutely critical but it can't be done at any price. We have got to be innovative. We've got to collaborate with people in the market, uh, in our sector, so that we find the least impacting path and the path that is most cost efficient. And where is, so, great, sounds great. It's very, very um, laudable, all that sentiment, but what is the reality? What will we have to deliver? to demonstrate that, we're, that this is, is happening for us. And the six sort of dimensions that we've looked at under the leadership umbrella, one is crystal clear, if we don't get approximately, you can argue the numbers, but if we don't get approximately 10,000 megawatts of onshore wind, offshore wind, and solar, the numbers won't add up. There won't be 70% renewables in the power system. The maths are really, really clear on that. So the first challenge we have is to work with people in this room and deliver the necessary connections to make this happen. Secondly, and it goes without saying, and we do recognize some of you know, the challenges we have here, is to reinforce the grid. The grid has to be fit for purpose for the extra renewables that are coming on the system and for the extra demand that's being generated, particularly in, in the... Um, in the Dublin area. And that reinforcement comes in the form of new lines, and there'll have to be new lines. Existing lines being upgraded to deliver higher performance, and the deployment of technology so that we can get more out of existing assets. Thirdly, 
We must have interconnection. If we don't have interconnection, and if the people in this room don't see a clear pathway for us to increase, uh, increase interconnection, then you won't invest in your projects. We know that, because you can't deal with high levels of curtailment. You can't fund projects. So the Celtic interconnector is an absolute top priority. And secondly, we're clearly enabling and are engaging with third parties who are going to provide private infrastructure in that space. Clearly, coming up with the technical solutions to deliver 95% renewables on the power system is a whole challenge and project and program in its own right. Uh, and I'll speak to that a bit later when I talk about partnership. That's, again, crystal clear. We need, to, on that November night, to be, have the whole power system running effectively on, on offshore wind and onshore wind. The market is now part of the power system. They're inextinguishable indistinguishable and we have to make sure that the market evolves so that people who can give us solutions can get appropriately remunerated because they're not going to invest if they can't make a return on their investment so every elegant or sophisticated engineering proposition we come up with must be one that is realizable in terms of a solution in the market that can allow that to be properly remunerated and lastly, what we call our Walk to Talk program, we need to look at ourselves in terms of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, how we, how we carry out our daily business, and ask ourselves, what can we do to be an exemplar company in terms of how we work, how we travel, how we behave, what we use in terms of uh, disposables, etc., etc., etc. So we want, we, we have great partnership with business in the community, but that's only the start of it. We want to take that sense of walk the talk, of real purpose into the everyday working, every, every working day in Airgrid. So that's our leadership primary goal. On the operate, develop and enhance the All Ireland Grid market, that's business as usual, never taking our eye off the ball in terms of our core remit. But if we didn't have the, the first goal, in this space, we have to, we're going to see 23% increase in demand for electricity in the next number of years. We're going to see steady evolution of the market as Europe increasingly seeks to have greater competition, deepen integration across, bound, across borders, and, and I suppose impose a whole new set of codes, regulations, market, market adjustments. There is a whole industry in just keeping the normal day-to-day -day business going. And the reason we have this center stage in our strategy is a genuine sense of fear within our own organization that we get carried away by the big stuff and lose sight of the day-to-day -day core remit. We will never do that. And in every future strategy, and whoever presents them after me in years to come, you can never lose sight of that, and that, that will appear. Part, work with partners for positive change. We can't do this on our own. <coughs> Very simple. We cannot do something of this scale, at the most radical transformation in the power system since electricity arrived in Ireland. We cannot do this on our own. We have a critical partnership already in existence with ESB in Ireland and ESB and NIEN in Northern Ireland around the provision and the delivery of infrastructure. We are in the process of transforming that relationship to deliver better solutions, more, more efficiently, and at lower cost. And we are committed to that. And we've put that ambition right at the heart of the strategy. Because if we don't, it is a real risk to, to, to failure. The world of the DSO, Dis Distribution System Operator, is going to change radically in the next 10 years. Electrification of transport, electrification of heat. It is absolutely vital that we as TSO and the two DSOs in, in Ireland and Northern Ireland work collaboratively on the best end-to-end -end solution for the customer. And that we don't end up in a situation where we've one solution in the TSO and a different one in the DSO. We've recognised that with our partners and we're talking about how we put in place deep collaborative structures so that the customer and the overall system gets the best result. We have a huge partnership emerging with our colleagues in France to deliver a 1 billion euro 
uh, interconnector between Ireland and France. You know, as big a capital project as, as you'll get in, in Ireland, give, leaving aside the Children's Hospital. But that's in the, in, in the big, really in the big ticket space. And we're, we're going to have to build a really, really strong partnership with our French colleagues so we deliver the right outcome for Ireland and for France. And we're very much committed to that. To put 95% renewables on the power system and ensure the power system remains stable. And sometimes we take this for granted, and you see what happened in the UK only four or six weeks ago when the system fell over and there was a series, some very serious outages. We need, we have some of the best people in the world in this space, but we want some of the best people in the world who can help us. Global companies who have the capability to bring real value into this program real intellectual property and help us deliver this program on time at a reasonable cost with strong governance and in a way that's deeply transparent with the market so that we can get, get the inputs from, from market participants. And in that regard, we're going to start the process of looking for partners within a matter of weeks. I'm, I'll touch on one or two others. In the area of information technology, there is so much change happening in our business and in everybody's business, we need to look at how we deploy data and, and what systems we need, and we will need help to do that. And I suppose the last area is the market. As the power system evolves, the market's going to change. And again, finding the right partner to give us the right result at the most cost-effective price is, 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 is key. So look, there is, pe people talk about, you know, my, my thoughts on this whole space are, one, know what you're good at and be really, really good at it. Secondly, know what you're not so good at or what you don't know. And you're not, you're not diminished by saying that. You're actually being courageous by saying that because you're recognizing what you don't have. And what you don't have, go and find it and get it from some of the best companies in the world and have a partnership that speaks to our purpose, which is transforming the power system for future generations. Engage. So I'm going to bring you back to Leo and Kay, and this enormous challenge of getting, gaining the trust of communities and people around the country, while meeting the expectation that the young people have set for us. We, and I, when I say we, I mean me, and I mean leaders in this room, have got to start getting the conversation going around this vision for the future. I was on Morning Ireland this morning being asked about the strategy launch. The journalist didn't mention the Climate Action Plan once and didn't mention uh, climate change. That, that's what we're up against here. And until we can paint a picture that people can understand and start the process of educating people, then we have a serious risk that we're going to come up against the trust barrier and that's going to manifest in, ter in terms of opposition against what it is we want to do. So we all have a responsibility in relation to this. And we all have to up our game, frankly. And John spoke eloquently about Airgrid's six-step process, which, from my experience, is really leading edge. But we need to be maybe smart enough to recognize, with this challenge ahead of us, we may have to bring it up another couple of notches. Because you can't go into a community no matter how good a story you have, and not have something to give them. And I think we need to change our thinking. I think the renewable sector needs to change its thinking and get to this notion that that has to be a win-win. They have to have a stake in what we're doing, whatever that stake is. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not being prescriptive, but they have to feel they want you there and that they're part of the story and they've got something to gain. So that's our fourth goal, which is, again, stressing it's better outcomes for all, not for the project, because it's not successful for the project if the stakeholders aren't happy and are going up against you. This is a statement from Richard Bruton, uh, which he made at a, a, a conference, um, a, an event he was speaking at a couple of, about six weeks ago, and I just wrote it down frantically as he was saying it. Um, and it's a very profound statement, because I've, been, I've stood in, in, on podia like this before, and I've been on panels where I've been pointing the finger at government, I've been pointing the finger at policymakers, 
lack of legislation here, lack of le you know, the usual stuff that we all get exercised over if, if you're in the, the development business. Um, and I think Richard Bruton, Minister Bruton, has rightfully, I think, turned the spotlight away from himself and he's put it on us. And he said leaders in public and private bodies have a profound responsibility to drive the, the change agenda. And he's right. Uh, we accept that responsibility in Airgrid. Uh, and part of this whole leadership dimension speaks to that. We have to do an awful lot more in that space. You have to take responsibility if you're in this sector. There's no point in bemoaning matters. We have to get that trust. We've got to get into a position of trust. And we've got to convince people that they have a stake in this future of a 2030 Ireland, which is massively transformed in terms of our social and our business proposition. One last thing, I just I give you a bit of an anecdote, a personal anecdote from nine days ago. So um, I'm sure there's people in this room have experience of Alzheimer's, one of the most awful diseases that um, that known to man. Um, so I have personal experience of a relative staying with us at the moment who has Alzheimer's. And the thing about Alzheimer's is people, they ask you loads of questions. And sometimes the questions can be actually quite profound. Sometimes the questions are repeated ad nauseum. So I was in my um, kitchen Friday before last, in my gym gear at 6.15 a.m. Heading into, heading into work. And the person in question ghosted into the kitchen at 6.15. I got an awful shock. And uh, so she asked me a couple of questions. One was, what day is it? So I said it was Friday. Um, what time of the morning was it? And I said, 6.15, you should go back to bed. It's very, very early in the morning. And she says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to work. And, uh, and she said, um, do you like it? And I said, yes. And then I got the, you know, it's a bit like my grandson might ask me this question, why? <laughs> and I said, very simply, because I get to make a difference. And I, I do, and everybody in this room can make a difference. You just have to really think about the influence you can have, the role you can have. It actually is an option to make a difference, and I'm calling on everybody in this room to really think about making a difference. This is really challenging what we have to do, but you look back at that litany of amazing times in terms of our history and the things that were achieved. There is absolutely no reason we can't achieve this if we put all of this horsepower and intellectual property and, and drive and will to do it. Thank you very much.